Hello, folks. Welcome back to English 408, Introduction to Literary Criticism. This is going to be a video lecture for module four over psychoanalytic criticism that is due a week from today on February 21st. Um, so in the assignment itself inside of Canvas, this is module four. And you'll see that there, like previous modules, a number of works to read and work through. Uh, I am right now making this video lecture that I will then post and announce in Canvas. <clears throat> um, let me just sign out here. So I'll begin uh, pretty much in the same order that we have them here in the course schedule or in the module, uh, the handout on psychoanalytic criticism, uh, Barry's chapter five on psychoanalytic criticism, excerpts from Freud's interpretation of dreams, uh, his fetishism essay that follows and uh, Jacques Lacan's The Mirror Stage. A um, lot, of, lot of ground to cover here. And, you know, just a reminder, uh, I say at the beginning of the syllabus here that um, the reading will be dense and intense. And this is yet another example of that particularly with uh, Lacan, as we will see. So here's the handout, if you will, the kind of brief guide overview of psychoanalytic criticism. And unlike say, you know, the structuralists who believe that the world is constituted through language or the post-structuralists who come along and say that, you know, there is no, certainty in language, therefore it can't, reality can't be really fixed in language. Um, Psychoanalytic criticism believes that the world is structured in the structures of our mind, right? Um, and <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, important information we, can glean from psychoanalytic criticism, but much of it over the years has been either revised and or wholesale rejected by various schools of thought, particularly feminism, as we'll see. Um, so for example, in terms of things, ideas, concepts that are valuable that we still use, Freud here, uh, gave us, you know, these really important psychological concepts, the uh, sort of father of, uh, you know, psychoanalysis, we call it. Uh, things like uh, the id and ego and superego, right? Um, those are still kind of in play in various therapy uh, sessions, depending on what kind of therapist you have. Um, he gave us also a lot of uh, terms, like you see here, italicized, that we have over the years used to kind of describe what's happening to individuals, particularly individuals with psychosis and or neuroses, um, you know, real mental conditions. Um, and so you all may be familiar with, I hope you're roughly familiar with if you've taken uh, any kind of introduction to psychology course, uh, this notion of you know, the unconscious uh, and the conscious, right? You know, this iceberg metaphor. And uh, it's a, you know, still pretty helpful metaphor uh, of understanding human, the human mind, right? Um, so, you know, I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but uh, uh, there are 
again, important to, to know if you're not uh, familiar with. Um, we're gonna come back to this one, for example, the castration complex. Um, when we look at the fetishism essay by, uh, by Freud. Um, his disciple, also shown here smoking a cigar, uh, the French psychoanalyst uh, Jacques Lacan, that's how you pronounce his name, um, developed this notion uh, of the real, imaginary, and symbolic, as you see here. And as you can see in the image, and this is called a Borromean knot, uh, which is a you know mathematical really uh, illustration of what he's trying to talk about here. That all three of these concepts, the real, imaginary, and symbolic, are intertwined in the human psyche, and uh, none of them can be uh, released. Uh, they're all kind of coexisting at the same time. Um, it, as I say here, if any one of the links is severed, the whole thing falls apart. Um, and these real imaginary and symbolic occur in different stages, he argues. Um, this very, very kind of simply put, uh, the imaginary in his notion is things, ideas, concepts, really images for, for him. Uh, that are within our imagination. And uh, for Lacan, this develops first and human beings, infants, all of us. Um, <clears throat> and he says right here, uh, you know, individuals permanently trapped and captivated by his or her own image. Uh, that's kind of true, uh, you know, we, are captivated by our own image, both in our minds, you know, we have this kind of objective sense of how we're moving through the world, but also um, in terms of like seeing ourselves in the mirror as evil described with the infant. The second phase is the symbolic, and that's sort of automatically uh, going to occur once you have the imaginary. Um, so the symbolic, he kind of says, is for lack of a better way to describe this, because it gets pretty difficult and intense with Lacan. Uh, think of the symbolic as culture, right? Uh, you know, constitutes the realm of culture because it is outside of the imaginary, right? And therefore, uh, the symbolic, as it says here, embodies the field or category of alterity or otherness. If you haven't seen, uh, you may have seen this word, you know, other capital O uh, in terms of post-colonial criticism, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks, uh, but another more kind of accurate word uh, and psychologically is alterity for otherness. And the final stage is uh, the real. And it's located entirely outside of these uh, imaginary and symbolic, right? Um, but I guess the easiest way to think of this is uh, if we go all the way back to think of, you know, as describing the sign uh, that signified a signifier and um, this sort of uh, a priori concept that Plato has of what's called the platonic forms that for Plato, the table that you see in front of you uh, is a representation or representation of the real table, which is in the carpenter's mind before he even builds the table. Uh, so that these forms, God, love, table, cat, so on, um, the, the real pure essence of it exists, uh, you know, intangibly, if you will. And that's closely akin to the real here for Lacan. Um, okay, so that's just a brief overview of uh, this handout here. So before we dive into Barry, which is an explanation of both Freud and Lacan and the uses to which uh, critics use psychoanalytic criticism, 
I just want to point out um, that for eons, um, millennia, really, human beings have been fascinated with the way the human mind works, as we can see in all of these different religions where dreams become an important feature of these sacred texts. So, uh, you know, in the Old Testament uh, of Judaism, uh, but, you know, Old and New Testament are for, you know, Christians. Um, you know, we have all of these different examples of dreams, right? Dream interpretation and uh, the power and importance of dreams. And we, of course, have dreams in the New Testament as well. Uh, Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam, they all, they all have various uh, representation of dreams. So I just wanted to remind you guys of that because, uh, you know, these texts literally, you know, they're sacred texts, but they can be read in a psychoanalytic way if you're, you know, understanding the concepts, the principles of Freud and Lacan. Um, okay, so Barry uh, here in chapter five uh, reminds us that, you know, the, the principal function of psychoanalytic criticism is to think about the, as he says right here, the interaction of conscious and unconscious, right? In terms of not just the characters, but even the author in a text, uh, which is, you know, far and away from new criticism that never wanted to even think about the author. So we're reminded, Barry reminds us that, you know, Freud kind of started it all off here. Um, and uh, notice he uses the word unconscious uh, as opposed to subconscious. And in fact, he has a section, uh, there's the, it's be going it again. Um, Barry has a section a little bit below here. Should we say, unconscious or subconscious. And uh, just to cut to the chase, he's going to say that we, in terms of literary criticism, right, should avoid using the term subconscious, right? Uh, because it kind of suggests or uh, presupposes that there is a pre-conscious before the subconscious. So he ends up concluding, so we should be consistent in our own usage and speak of the unconscious, not the subconscious. We're referring to Freudian ideas in the context of literary interpretation. So I'm pointing that out, folks, because if you know, you're know you tackling uh, the first question in module four, uh, it's all about Freud, as you will see here. So remember there are three potential questions. So this one, uh, letter A says, according to Simon Freud, what constitutes the relationships between dream thoughts and language or speech as he puts it? How do we represent the reality of the dream either for the individual or for individual therapy or more importantly for our purposes, literary critical analysis, <clears throat> right? You can go in and have individual therapy for understanding what your dreams might mean, right? That's kind of what uh, Joseph is doing to Pharaoh in the Old Testament. Uh, he's interpreting or telling what Pharaoh's dream was. Um, or for our purposes, you know, uh, discerning a dream or dream-like state in a text. Speaking of which, let me just... Uh, put myself on pause before I go back to the uh, unconscious and subconscious. Um, so you may recall that, you know, one of the texts I keep referring to is this uh, oval portrait uh, by uh, Edgar Allan Poe, right? And this sh short story <clears throat> is a reminder that this story can be read in many different ways. Uh, last time we talked about how, uh, you know, if we apply some pressure to the word delirium 
right? His incipient delirium, as it says in the text, that the story begins to kind of unravel in terms of its reliability of its narrator. Um, but here, because we learned that the, the guy was you know, severely wounded, as you can see here, uh, and he has been given opium by his valet or valet, as they would say in Britain, um, that he's not in his right mind. And therefore, when he is looking around this room at all of these pictures and images, right, and he comes across this book, the oval portrait image as well, um, we could read this short story through a psychoanalytic lens that uh, this is, you know, a kind of manifestation of some quasi dream state that the character, the narrator is having, because, uh, you know, it's in first person, or perhaps even go a little deeper and say, you know, this is maybe some projection of Edgar Allan Poe's. So uh, returning to uh, this idea about Freud and what Barry's trying to kind of uh, discern here, when you are writing about Freud and dreams in particular, please, please, please use the word um, uh, unconscious, right? Like you'll see it here in the uh, these images, right? So it's it's not subconscious, even though, you know, this part is below and that's what sub the prefix means. Um, it's the unconscious as opposed to the conscious, right? So, you know, the conscious means you're awake, you realize you're in a room, there are four walls, the sun is shining or not. Um, that's the conscious, you're, you know, you're aware. The unconscious is everything that we're unaware of and that can manifest according to Freud itself in dreams. So just make sure you use the correct term when you're writing about Freud. Um, all right, getting back to Barry. Um, so there are a lot of um, terms that he, Freud gives us to try to understand how to think of dreams or how to think of people with uh, psychosis. And um, here is, is one that you may be familiar with, uh, something called a, a Freudian slip. It's really actually called peripataxis. Uh, but it's when there's, uh, you know, like it says down here, slips of the tongue or pen. Um, you know, if uh, you have someone who has a verbal slip of the tongue, um, you know, I just remembered, you know, as an undergraduate, uh, a professor saying out loud, instead of describing in a computer literacy class, the uh, floppy disk, as it was known back then, uh, she said floppy dick and the entire class burst out laughing, right? But that's what we would call a slip of the tongue or Freudian slip or peripataxis. Uh, but Freud would say it's really not a slip of the tongue, that there is some kind of repression, as he says here, right? That there is always a return of the re repress. There's some kind of repression that's coming to the foreground, right? Uh, that's one way of understanding characters when they speak, you know, do they speak in words that uh, reveal another kind of motivation? Um, so, Let's see here. Um, right here. Um, Freudian interpretation then has always been of considerable interest to literary critics. The basic reason again is that the unconscious, notice not subconscious, that the unconscious like the poem or novel or play cannot speak directly and explicitly Right, it is it's just words on a page, and does so through images, symbols, emblems, and metaphors. Literature too is not involved with making direct, explicit statements about life, 
but with showing and expressing experience through imaginary symbolism, metaphor, and so on, or imagery, excuse me, symbolism, metaphor, and so on. However, because the statements made are not explicit, that is, you don't have, you know, a character saying, this is what I think, right? Uh, it's just a character saying something, but behind that statement might be their real intent. Um, because they're not explicit, there is an inevitable judgmental element involved. Uh, we as uh, both critics and readers, you know, kind of have these uh, judgmental elements, right? That, we might impose on a character or narrator. And in consequence, psychoanalytic interpretation of literature are often controversial, which is true. Um, I'm gonna show you with a famous example or infamous example of Freud here in a minute. Um, and speaking of which, um, because of the way Freud practiced his craft, if you will, uh, it can be very, not only prescriptive, but very um, subjective because it's based on, you know, who's doing the interpretation, you know, who's reading the story or reading the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, in this case, the dream. And so this is the uh, kind of infamous example. It's uh, the story of Dora, this girl, and it appeared officially in uh, the fragment of an analysis of a case of hysteria. Um, speaking of which, Freud, as it points out in our Norton uh, of him, um, wrote quite a bit about, as you can see here, um, studies on hysteria. And hysteria is typically a kind of physical and or psychological phenomenon often associated with women. Um, and, you know, they thought these, what were called sexologists at the time, including Freud, they thought that uh, somehow um, <clears throat> there was a related to women's physicality um, and uh, you know, if uh, <clears throat> you think about the word hysteria, right? And there's you know, Freud. Um, it's actually, <clears throat> excuse me, it's actually related to the womb, uh, hyster. Well, that's not, sorry. <clears throat> so uh, what uh, Freud was trying to figure out is, you know, what makes women, you know, what we might today say, suffer from manic depressive, schizoaffective disorder, or different kinds of, of dissociative orders, um, but the word itself, right, hystera or hystera, uh, is the Greek word for uterus. So if you think of a hysterectomy, right, it's the removal of the uterus in women to try to prevent this kind of supposed hysteria. That is, they believed incorrectly that the uterus was causing women to suffer from hysteria. Um, so that's you know, him writing on hysteria. But in this um, uh, story, it's uh, Freud practicing uh, his dream interpretation, if you will, in relation to this girl who is brought to him and suffers from you know, some mental issues, as you will read in this uh, story. So there's a and Dora and her mother and her father, of course. And then there are friends of the family named Mr. and Mrs. K. Okay. And it says a sexual relationship developed between Dora's father and Mrs. K, 
which went on for several years. Mr. K knew of this. So, uh, you know, I don't know if we would call these, you know, an open marriage or swingers or what, but um, they all knew of it. And all three adults seem to have had an unspoken agreement at that exchange, as it were, doors should be made available to Mr. K. Um, and so this dream that Dora has, uh, which I'll read down here in a minute, uh, is interpreted by Freud to basically mean that she's having repressed desires for Mr. K, who's a much older man. She's only, I think it says here, she's only 14, right? Um, it says here that uh, when she was 14 in a state of obvious excitement, he suddenly took hold of her, of Dora, and began to kiss her. That is this older Mr. K. She reacted with a violent feeling of disgust and ran out. Freud considered this reaction neurotic. In his view, quote, this was surely just the situation to call up a distinct feeling of sexual excitement in a girl of 14, since Mr. K, as he explains in a footnote, was still quite young and of prepossessing appearance. <laughs> okay, so, you know, my parents, you know, family friend is, you know, trying to basically molest me at 14, and I'm supposed to think that's okay, Freud? Anyhow, uh, this kind of stuff goes on for a while, uh, and she has dreams, like the first of two dreams right here, and here's Here's one, okay, of, of Dora's dreams. A house was on fire. My father was standing beside my bed and woke me up. I dressed quickly. Mother wanted to stop and save her jewel case. But father said, I refuse to let myself and my two children be burnt for the sake of your jewel case. We heard downstairs and as soon as I was outside, I woke up. Okay, that's the dream. And then Freud, this is his interpretation of it here. Uh, basically says that, you know, uh, I'm just gonna skip to the chase here. The fire represents her, Dora's own repressed passion for Mr. K. Uh, the figure of Mr. K is transposed with that of the father to express the wish that her formal Oedipal love for her father will protect her from the temptation to yield to Mr. K's advances. Um, <laughs> uh, and noting, you know, that the word jewel case, right, is slang for female genitals in German. Um, so this is one of many examples where, especially feminists, as we'll get to next week, which is why I've, you know, put them in this order, like we need to kind of understand what it was and is that feminists reject in psychoanalytic criticism. Um, one of many examples where they say, you know, this is just insane. How could you think that a girl of 14 would have these repressed desires for, you know, an older man who's married and, you know, is the friend of the family of her father and so on. Um, and, you know, in some ways it says more about Freud than does Dora, right? Um, so notice this term right here, Oedipal love. Um, it's another feature technique that Freud uses in the interpretation of dreams is as we'll see in the uh, uh, dream state uh, here in a minute that he believes, Freud believes that all of our desires, issues, if you will, begin in childhood in relation to our parents, as it happened with Oedipus himself. Um, so Freudian psychoanalytic critics, they give importance in literary interpretation to the distinction between the conscious and unconscious mind, right? What is the character aware of? What are the intents, the motivations, um, right? They pay close attention to unconscious motives and feelings. Um, they also pay attention to symptoms, conditions, phases. Um, these phases um, are for Freud developed in early on in infancy. Uh, if you've ever seen, for example, in the oral stage, a child um, doesn't really understand the world 
around outside of him or herself. But one way to understand the world is to put it in your mouth, is to taste it, right? So, you know, regardless of what kind of object, including dirt, it might be, you, you know, that's one way um, that we as human beings try to, you know, first negotiate, navigate the world. Uh, and what it will say of these phases is that sometimes uh, people are stuck in these various uh, infantile stages. The anal, of course, being you know uh, wanting to you know play with the anus and have things uh, up there or whatnot. And then the phallic stage is being obsessed with the phallus. Phallus is another name for uh, penis, which we're going to talk about here in a bit because of uh, the castration issue with Freud. Um, so this is kind of what uh, uh, Freud does. And again, uh, here's Hamlet and he uses Hamlet the play and the character to you know, talk about this uh, Oedipal complex, right? Um, Psychoanalytic criticism offers a neat and simple solution. Hamlet cannot avenge this crime because he is guilty of wanting to commit the same crime himself. He has an Oedipus complex that is a repressed sexual desire for his own mother and a consequent wish to do away with his father. Thus, the uncle has merely done what Hamlet himself secretly wished to do, hence the difficulty for him being the Avenger. Uh, if you may remember, uh, you know, the basic story of Hamlet is that uh, Claudius, the uncle of Hamlet, has killed before the play starts Hamlet's father, who's also named Hamlet, and uh, Hamlet's mother, Gertrude, very quickly marries Claudius, his uncle, uh, but this causes confusion and anxiety in Hamlet because he you know, knows because the ghost of the father has come to visit Hamlet and he knows that the Claudius has you know, done him wrong, killed him uh, to take over the throne. And in this uh, interpretation of dreams, Hamlet uh, basically uses this Oedipal uh, motivation, if you will, to explain Hamlet's uh, anxieties. Um, so uh, let's, I guess, look at that a bit. Um, that is the interpretation of dreams. And there it is uh, right here. In this new theory of unconscious desire, also known as the Oedipus complex, uh, he substituted the desiring son for the abused daughter and the desirable mother for the guilty father. Um, so, uh, just as a reminder, you know, Sophocles, Oedipus, Rex, and we had this in relation to Claude Levi Strauss when he was doing these different versions of the myth themes of Oedipus. Um, the kind of base story is there's a prophecy that this child, Oedipus, will grow up to kill his father and marry his mother. And that's exactly what comes to pass. And Oedipus tries to run away from his fate, but of course he's just running closer and quick, more quickly to it. And um, this whole issue of anxiety of the son toward the father and this supposed repressed desire for the mother uh, comes from this play Oedipus Rex by Sophocles. Um, let me finally, okay, here we go. These are excerpts, right? <clears throat> These are not the, the entire work. Uh, Freud wrote dozens and dozens of uh, works, uh, which are take many volumes. So it begins here when he's talking about how to use dreams and the interpretation of dreams for psychoanalytic reasons, um, that one of the most important things to think about is the Oedipus complex here, and it explains it. In my experience, which is already extensive, and that's a little bit of you know 
hubris on his part, but it's also true. That is to say, he, Freud, was quite invested in studying, analyzing uh, neurotic and psychotic patients, typically in what we might call, you know, uh, mental homes. Back then, they would have called it an asylum. Um, and, you know, he, he has a lot of experience so he's kind of reminding us that you know he's just not talking off the top of his head my experience which is already extensive the chief part in the mental lives of all children so that's you and me and everyone who later become psychoneurotics is played by their parents okay so he's saying kind of from a grounding premise that the child is always kind of beginning in relation to his or her parents, whether they're present or not, right? Being in love with the one parent and hating the other are among the essential constituents of the stock of psychical impulses, which is formed at that time, and which is of such importance in determining the symptoms of later neurosis. So, if you've ever met anyone that you think has some psychological issues, whether it's, you know, bipolar, manic depressive, schizoaffective, or could even say depression, or, you know, different kinds of mental uh, illnesses, and, you know, there's a spectrum. Uh, Freud would say, and as you can see here, argues that it all begins with, you know, the relationship to one or more parents, okay? You may not believe this and that's fine if you don't, right? Because uh, certainly a lot of people reject this, but it's important to know where he, where his starting point is, right? So, right, there's the whole story of, you know, Oedipus, which I'm not gonna rehearse because I just did. Um, so, Here we go. Or <clears throat> it goes on to say, <clears throat> sure why this is not coming up. There it is. So there's an unmistakable indication in the text of Sophocles' tragedy itself that the legend of Oedipus sprang from some primeval dream material which has as its content, the distressing disturbance of a child's relation to his parents owing to the very first stirrings of sexuality. Okay, this is Freud. <laughs> so surprise, surprise, there's a mention of sex and parents together, uh, which you know, for most of us just makes us wonder what the hell Freud is thinking, right? But this is uh, what he believes or believed. Um, there's this, you know, discussion of Hamlet again. Um, oops, sorry. Oh, I'm not sure why this is. Uh... <clears throat> I'm going to have to reopen this. Um, He's going to go on to explain that uh, all of these, whether it's you know, Hamlet or uh, you know Sophocles, um, that they all work, and I'm using that word deliberately. They all work through dream interpretation, right? And so he's going to try to describe here this difference between dream thoughts and dream content. Uh, they're similar to each other, uh, obviously related to the dream, but they're not the same. He says, we have introduced a new class of psychical material between the manifest or clear or evident content of dreams and the conclusions of our inquiry, namely their latent 
content. Or as we say, as people like him, psychoanalysts say, the dream thoughts arrived at by means of our procedure. It is from these dream thought, thoughts and not from a dream's manifest content that we disentangle its meaning. So it's going to go on to describe that um, the dream thoughts should be more like, uh, as he says here, a transcript, right? So, you know, we all have dreams and think about you trying to tell someone, you know, you wake up and say, man, I had this crazy dream, right? Uh, when are they, when are they not crazy? I mean, that, you know, otherwise <laughs> there'd be complete, it would be the conscious world if it was completely rational. Um, so you try to explain it to someone, right? And that's, you know, what you might call uh, a transcript, if you will, of the dream, even though it's, it's clearly disjunctive um, versus what he calls the dream content, right? What he says right here is, the dream content, on the other hand, is expressed, as it were, in pictographic script, the characters of which have to be transposed individually into the language of the dream thought, right? That, you know, it's your, your language of the dream thought is what you're trying to convey to the person you're telling your dream to, right? But it's the dream content that it's this kind of uh, series of images, or as he says, pictographic scripts in your head as you know, um, disjunctive as they might be. So um, in other words, when you're trying to, let, let me go back to, well, I, I guess I don't have to show you the image, the, the Edgar Allan Poe story, right? Um, you know, Poe is telling us the story, but it's really through the first person narration of the narrator you know, I did this, I saw these pictures. Um, so that would be, you know, the kind of transcript, if you will, of the dream, if, you know, he's really tripping on opium because he was given opium for his wound, his injury. Uh, and then what we have is this kind of collage of images that he sees in the room, all of these pictures, including the opal portrait, and then this, you know, story and the story of the artist and his wife, and she dies and all that. That would be the pictographic script, right? If any of that is legitimately true, right? Like, you know, is, is Poe just messing with us? Uh, so there's something that occurs in interpreting dreams. And that's called, one of them is called condensation, right? The first thing that becomes clear to anyone who compares the dream content with the dream thoughts is that a work of condensation on a large scale has been carried out. Dreams are brief, meager, and laconic, you know, lazy, kind of lethargic in comparison with the range and wealth of dream thoughts, which is kind of true. That is a condensation, you know, means like a, a compression, right? Um, the, the dream itself can happen you know, in a matter of seconds or even less, uh, but inside of, you know, from beginning to end, inside of that flurry of images and things that you may experience as your dream, um, Freud would say that has been condensed and there's a lot more there, right? Um, so he goes on to say, as a rule, one underestimates the amount of compression that has taken place since one is inclined to regard dream thoughts that have been brought to light as the complete material. Whereas if the work of interpretation is carried further, it may still reveal more thoughts concealed behind the dream. And the way to think about this is to go back to the um, Dora story or, or uh, dream. So here's the little dream, right? That she tells him just matter of factly, you know, house is on fire, then eventually I woke up. And then what Freud does here, as you can see, firstly, secondly, thirdly, fourthly, he unpacks the dream in his interpretation because he believes that in this very brief dream, a lot has been compressed. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, 
So aside from uh, condensation, there's something called displacement. It happens, uh, one could argue, both in the unconscious and the conscious world. Um, so he says, uh, if that is so, a transference and displacement of psychical intensity occurs in the process of dream formation. And it is a result of these that the difference between the text of the dream content and that of the dream thoughts comes about. That is, there's a disconnect, if you will, because there's uh, often what he calls displacement going on. The process by which we are here presuming is nonetheless than the essential uh, portion of the dream work, and it deserves to be described as dream displacement. Dream displacement and dream condensation are the two governing factors to whose activity we may in essence ascribe the form assumed by dreams. That is, that's the way that we receive them, that they've uh, been condensed and, and they're often displaced uh, in terms of uh, who they're representing. And uh, speaking of representation, um, we found, right, that uh, a dream has these two factors at work. So um, he says, <clears throat> when the whole mass of these dream thoughts is brought under the pressure of the dream work, and its elements are turned about, broken into fragments and jammed together, almost like pack ice. That is, you know, when you're trying to make sense of your dream, whether for yourself or someone else, um, it's, you know, you're kind of forcing all these images or pictographic images in your head. The question arises of what happens to the logical connections which have hitherto formed its framework. Uh, and he spends a, quite a bit of time below here talking about these concepts of, you know, if, because, just as, although, either, or, which if you think about it, um, dreams don't really, uh, at least, you know, I can vouch for myself, maybe you as well, um, they don't really suppose or navigate or take into consideration these figures of speech, if you will, like, if this happens in my dream, then this will occur later in the dream, or because this happened, here is a result, right? Uh, they happen so quickly and so, again, disjunctively or disconnectedly that um, these otherwise logical markers of English syntax or human language uh, aren't there. So, yeah, the, uh, you know, question one or letter A ask, you know, so what constitutes a relationship between dream thoughts and language or speech? Uh, how do we represent the reality of the dream? Um, so, you know, it's not too entirely difficult to figure out what he's talking about, especially if you use the example of Dora again. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, this is where he's talking about, you know, dreams cannot express the either or So uh, I cut this reading short. Uh, you know, it's 1900 and then republished in 1929. Um, so that uh, you can move on to the next essay here, uh, which is fetishism uh, right here at the, the end of this reading. And again, all of these come from uh, the Norn Anthology of Theory and Criticism. Um, so before we move on to uh, the fetish here, maybe I should go back up to the introductory section. So the, uh, you call it, uh, Norton editors can give you what they're talking about here. Freud's short essay titled Fetishism, 1927, our final selection, builds on his analysis of the consequences of sexual difference. 
Certain men, he claims, cannot accept the evidence that the woman or the mother doesn't have a penis. In order to fall in love with women and not become homosexual, they choose as a substitute some object that will continue to support the sexual interest they originally had in the missing maternal penis. The logic of fetishism thus involves both preserve, or excuse me, perceiving and denying the evidence of maternal castration, what we will refer to as castration anxiety. In a very different way, the same logic of denial and displacement underlies Karl Marx's theory of the fetishism of the commodity. There, the commodity, you know, think of things that you buy, commodities, the commodity itself appears to contain the value that is really produced by the processes of labor invisible behind it. That is, you know, you don't, when you buy a shoe, you know, Air Jordan or whatever, you don't typically think about who physical human being person or people put that shoe together, or where it came from, from Bangladesh or Vietnam or wherever. Um, here, the substitute foot, velvet, hair, et cetera, typically inanimate objects, appears to function like a sexual organ. In both cases, there is a gleam around the fetish that attracts desire, sexual or commercial, as if the fetish actually combined the values that it represents. Now, this may sound a little peculiar and odd uh, if you've never examined characters, literature, people, or your own lives through the lens of the fetish. Um, there is inside of your folder, uh, Google Drive folder, uh, the following document and um, comes from the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistics, excuse me, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uh, which is the sort of, as you can see here, the um, American Psychiatric and Psychological Association's manual for describing all uh, illnesses uh, from severe to mild. So it could be, you know, basic depression uh, to, you know, schizophrenia. Um, it's now in its fifth iteration, if you will. We just call it the DSM-5, um, right? And so uh, this is where the uh, definition is taken from that I'm gonna show you for uh, fetish, right? Um, so if you've taken a psychology class, you probably, uh, come into, you know, come into possession of this, whether in through reading or holding it. So in this, um, uh, description of the fetish, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, um, they said that <clears throat> at least a couple of the characteristics to qualify for something as a fetish, it had to be the use of non-living objects uh, in a repeatedly preferred or exclusive method of achieving sexual excitement. So, you know, like inanimate objects. The fetishes are not limited to articles of female clothing used in cross-dressing or the objects designed to be used for the purpose of sexual stimulation. Um, fetishes tend to be articles of clothing, such as female garments, shoes, boots, right? Um, and so I'm bringing this up because there's another way to think about the fetish. And uh, I have this uh, piece, I'll just quickly uh, show you. Uh, through through an image of what I'm talking about. So this was a paper that I originally gave at a MLA convention and was subsequently published here in this uh, 
Association for Scottish Literature website. And the, the prompt, if you will, for the panel, the MLA was, you know, um, the right here, the, you know, Scottish fetish. Okay. And this colleague of mine, Evan Gottlieb at uh, Oregon State University chaired the, the panel. And there are, you know, several of us uh, on it. And um, the, the driving uh, kind of principle was, okay, what is it about Scottish literature and culture that is fetishized other than kilts and bagpipes, right? Because if you think of those two things, they're sort of this trope to automatically represent Scottish literature or culture or people. And uh, I said, well, it's got to be whiskey, you know, if it's not <laughs> kilts or bagpipes. And so I describe here in this kind of triple function uh, that fetishes uh, cannot just be what we're talking about here with Freud, the psychosexual fetish, right? Uh, as the DSM-5 showed you, but it can be anthropological. It can be a commodity fetish as Marx is talking about, or as I argue in this, this paper, it can be all three simultaneously. Now, with regard to the, uh, you know, psychosexual, we already talked about, you know, uh, the you know inanimate object use of sexual gratification as that DSM-5 showed. Um, but with regard to the anthropological, if I can find where that, uh, there we go. It's not finding the, uh, the note here. Well, it has to do with the, this long footnote here. Um, about the original meaning of the word fetish, which comes from the Portuguese feticho. Um, so it was kind of used like uh, a talisman, right? Uh, that, uh, as I say here, you know, you might wear. Uh, a talisman around your neck to ward off evil spirits, right? That's the original kind of meaning of fetish, and that's from an anthropological context. But there is the commodity fetish uh, represented here in this image. Um, I just happened to, you know, get lucky and find that this. Uh, this moon import company created a line of uh, scotch whiskeys that on their label deliberately use, you know, female shoes, right? And remember, you know, one of the things it says here that could be used as a fetish are, you know, undergarment shoes, boots, right? And, and so the people who were creating this product, uh, the scotch, they deliberately knew what they were doing, right? Um, by sort of conflating, if you will, or marrying together that which people desire, scotch whiskey, but also in a kind of psychosexual way, the, uh, the shoe, right? Represented by these very kind of uh, ornate Italian or European, you know, women's shoes. Um, so let's look at that piece by Freud uh, essay called Fetishism. Um, now, this is also another departure point, if you will, for feminists to break with psychoanalytic criticism, particularly with Freud. Uh, he begins here, in the last few years, I haven't had an opportunity of studying analytically a number of men whose object choice was dominated by a fetish. Now, one of the problems with Freud, if you even go back and look at uh, Dora's you know, dream, is that Freud makes these often generalized broad bl blanket statements that either includes girls and women 
automatically, or he makes similar statements that automatically excludes women, even though they're part of the human race. So uh, this, you know, his focus here on men only is a bit, you know, of a problem to begin with. So he goes to this kind of rehearses this, uh, you know, for him, uh, shine on the nose origin of the fetish in German. Um, but this is not uh, where it really begins. Uh, he says, in every instance, the meaning and the purpose of the fetish turned out in analysis to be the same. And he's talking here about analyzing these, these men who seem to have, you know, some kind of what we might call uh, neurosis surrounding inanimate objects, perhaps, right? It, meaning the fetish, revealed itself so naturally and seemed to me so compelling that I'm prepared to expect the same solution in all cases of fetishism. So again, one of these kind of blanket statements. When well, now I announce that the fetish is a substitute for the penis, I shall certainly create disappointment. So I hasten to add that it is not a substitute for any chance penis, but for a particular and quite special penis that had been extremely important in early childhood, but had later been lost. That is to say, it should normally have been given up, but the fetish is precisely designed to preserve it from extinction. That's the important part of the fetish is that you glom onto this inanimate object or thing, whether it's you know Air Jordans or whatever, uh, to preserve this anxiety for the lack of something. To put it more plainly, the fetish is a substitute for the woman's, the mother's penis that the little boy once believed in and for reasons familiar to us, does not want to give up. Or what we might call the child has castration anxiety. So you can see right away how this description, you know, a lot of women would read this you are you, if you're a woman in this course, go, what the hell does that have to do with me? You know, like I don't have a penis and I never, you know, cared or desired uh, for this, you know, substitute penis, so to speak, uh, because, you know, my body parts are the same as my mother's body parts, right? So what he's uh, kind of, eliding or erasing is the fact that, you know, there's biological difference and therefore, you know, really can apply to everyone. Um, and in this section here on page uh, 843, he makes a pretty bold <laughs> and you might say reprehensible statement where understandably a lot of women might be pissed. He says, we can now see what the fetish achieves and what it is that it main, maintains it. It remains a token, right? Token, you know, something, souvenir, if you want to think of that, a triumph over the threat of castration and a protection against it, right? That the child, a boy, uh, thought, well, I have a penis, my mother must have a penis until he learns otherwise, right? Whether looking up her skirt or seeing her in the shower or whatever. And then upon that realization thinks, oh no, she gave up either willingly or not a penis and therefore I might lose mine too. This, this is Freud. <laughs> so um, it also saves the fetishist, the one practicing it from becoming a homosexual by endowing women with the characteristic which makes them tolerable as sexual objects. It's that phrase, tolerable as sexual objects that uh, always blows my mind when I read it. In later life, the fetishist feels that he enjoys yet another advantage from his substitute for genital. The meaning of the fetish is not known to other people, right? It's typically you know, visible or kept secret. So the fetish is not withheld from him. It is easily accessible and he can readily obtain the sexual gratification attached to it. What other men have to 
what other men have to woo and make exertions for, that is, you know, woman's vulva, vagina, uh, he had by the fetishist with no trouble at all. Um, yeah, a bit out there, you might say. Um, so what I'm asking here in letter B is, according to Freud, how does the fetish arise? I just explained that to you. He believes, you know, with the child, recognizes his mother not having a penis, therefore he develops this conceptual notion of the substitute penis that is imbued into this inanimate object. But then I go on to say, well, in what way or ways can we see the fetish functioning in text, whether it's literary, cinematic, and so on. Uh, in other words, like if you're reading a story or short story or novel and a character has a particular fascination with a kind of object or uh, some kind of clothing or something like that, that it's part of their, you know, not necessarily sexual either, right? But it's just that they uh, somehow, it, it forms and completes their identity. Uh, then how does that function? How does that work? Where can we see that and give ex specific examples of that? Um, in other ways, aside from, you know, I showed you with the scotch and the shoes on the label, um, there are people, I'm reminded of a former New York Giants uh, player who'd lived in Monroe, now moved to California. Um, but he had an entire um, shoe collection in, a, in like an entire room of this big house like you know, several rooms in this house, but this fairly sizable bedroom, there was nothing in it other than shelves and shelves of tennis shoes. And so, you know, if you're one of these people, right, that collects shoes, as many people do, like this image is showing you, and you know. Some people really do. You could call this the commodity fetish, right? Uh, remember, commodity is something you can buy. Um, now, it's not necessarily that this person or people um, is deriving any kind of sexual gratification from a collection, right? But it's this almost fascination and obsession with, um, you know, an object. Uh, I don't know why there's so many people who collect tennis shoes. What is up with this? Uh, <laughs> you know, sort of the classic one is, is women collecting high heels, right? To go with every outfit. Uh, maybe that's the same, same reason. Um, but yeah, so if you want to answer that question, right? Uh, in what ways can we see it functioning in text, right? You could... You could take it outside of uh, text and you know bring it into real life. All right, let's uh, look at Lacan. It's the last uh, thing we're going to talk about today, and it's actually the most difficult. Um, so the question asks here: If you want to choose this, letter C. How does the mirror stage function in the formation of our self? So that's you know, what is it? How does it? How does it arise? What is it for? What does it do? And for literary analysis, what is the interrelationship of these three categories, the real, the imaginary, and symbolic? So um, again, think of, you know, that uh, Borromean knot here of these three intertwined categories. And um, Lacan, is a little, little bit more challenging because of the way he writes, kind of like there the, so, uh, you know, another French author and therefore reading it in translation. Uh, and even Barry says here, Lacan's own explication of his ideas is often intimidatingly obscure. I would suggest that in reading him, you should devote some study time to reading the same piece several times rather than reading through a great deal of his work once only. Um, 
luckily this uh, this essay that I have for you here is not that long if you need to work through it more than once to answer letter C. Um, so he kind of borrows Lacan from the structuralist, right? By thinking about, okay, well, if language is, you know, the sign, which is the signified and signifier together, well, then let's, you know, because he's a student of Freud, let's think about the mind as being a structure of the unconscious and the conscious. So he uh, takes, takes that kind of uh, first crack at uh, trying to understand reality in that way. Um, I'm just going to skip a little bit down here. So this is where he begins to describe this mirror image, right? Um, because this is the name of the, the piece. If I go down after this long introduction. It's called the mirror stage as formative of the function of the eye as revealed in psychoanalytic experience. So we just typically call it the mirror stage to shorten it. So Barry here says, before the sense of self emerges, the young child exists in a realm which Lacan calls the imaginary. So going back over here to the handout, right? This is the first stage, the imaginary. Um, <clears throat> in which there is no distinction between self and other, see capital O, other meaning literally other people, but also everything that's not yourself is other, or we might say alterity. And there's a kind of idealized identification with the mother. So, yeah, it kind of makes a bit of sense if you think about it, if you had a child or you've seen a little child. Um, and in the essay, Lacan's going to use the image of a monkey and then relate it to a child. Um, the, or you could say a cat, because cats are always fun to watch in a mirror. Um, so what he's saying is that in this imaginary beginning stage, right, um, <clears throat> you're kind of, as an infant, you're all in your own little world. Right? It's all in your, your, your brain, you know. It's not until he, he goes on to the next stage between, he says, six months and 18 months comes what he calls the mirror stage. When the child sees its own reflection in the mirror and begins to conceive of itself as a unified being, separate from the rest of the world, right? So... If you've ever seen this, you know, I have a daughter and, you know, I've seen this and you may have seen it. Uh, when a child first looks in a mirror, it's confusing to them because they don't know what they're seeing, you know, and a cat or a child, once they start moving, right, and realize that, oh, if I put my hand on the mirror, right, I'm not really touching myself, but I can see my hand touching this object, this flat, you know, piece of glass. Um, and every time I move a certain way, the image and the reflection moves with me, right? And so, you know, it takes a while for the synapses to neural pathways, we might say, to, to get going, to go, oh, okay, I, I, I see this as my reflection, right? But once that occurs, that is the recognition that, oh, that is a reflection of myself, then Lacan says, immediately you move into uh, what he will call the symbolic, um, that you're no longer in the imaginary. Remember the symbolic is the second stage here, and it constitutes the realm of culture, everything outside of the imaginary, you know, otherness. So when you're, uh, you know, at that moment and a child then sort of gets or understands the light bulb goes off like, oh, 
like I am this this little creature, you know, like I have a body and I can move it in certain ways and it's different from other bodies and other things. Um, or, you know, the child can watch the cat walk in front of the mirror and then understand that as a separate creature as well. Then that kind of creates, uh, as he says here, this separation, uh, right? He goes on to say that at this stage, the child enters into the language system, essentially a system which is concerned with lack and separation, crucial Lacanian concepts, since language names what is not present and substitute a, substitutes a linguistic sign for it, right? You know, what is not present is we know something about which it is not, right? Like we know that it's the baby because it's not the reflection of the baby. The reflection is not the thing. Um, in fact, this is part of the reason why I've you know, introduced on the syllabus long ago, this image here. Uh, this is a famous painting or image by René Magritte, a French painter. And it, it is a painting, right? Um, at the bottom, in French, it says, Cessez ne pas un beep, right? Translated to, this is not a pipe. Well, it's true, it's not a pipe. It is a representation or representation of a pipe. Um, so let me just show you a better image of that. So what we're learning is that, you know, like the, uh, like the sign, the signified and the signifier, um, this clearly, you know, two dimensional representation of a pipe is not the actual thing, right? The actual thing we might hold in our hand and, and use, right? Uh, this is Magritte. <clears throat> so he labeled this, I mean, people sort of mistakenly, colloquially call it Cecina um, But as you can see from the syllabus, the, the actual name is it, La Tresson de Images. That is the treachery of images. Because uh, images, representations are deceptively treacherous to us, right? And so psychologically, this is what Lacan is kind of pulling out or teasing out in terms of this uh, second stage of the uh, symbolic. He says, uh, continues, this is Barry. This stage also marks the beginning of socialization with its prohibitions and restraints associated with the figure of the father, right? Thou shalt not. <laughs> How many times do we, you know, don't touch the stove, don't run, run across the street, don't say those words, don't do X, Y, or Z, right? Uh, and then finally, that's entering, as I said a second ago, into the symbolic. Um, so that uh, question is asking, <clears throat> letter C in module four, Um, how does the mirror states function and formation of ourself, right? Well, without it, we wouldn't have a concept of ourself as being separate from another person. Uh, up until that point, Lacan's arguing that a child has no distinction between itself and its mother or any other people for that matter. Uh, it's only when we have this kind of, as he says, unified perception of ourselves that we develop a sense of self. Uh, and then it goes on to ask, you know, for literary analysis, what is the interrelationship of these three? Well, it's not, I mean, it sounds like a hard question to answer, but um, if you're, again, thinking about, uh, you know, the symbolic stage here, right, of being 
you know, restraints and prohibitions associated with the figure of the father. It's every single thing that tells us as individuals or groups of people uh, not to do something, right? Uh, don't, you know, pick your uh, prohibition. Don't smoke cigarettes. Don't drink alcohol. Don't, you know, all of the commandments, you know, uh, don't murder. Uh, don't um, kneel or uh, sit during the national anthem. That's a prohibition, right? According to some people. Uh, don't protest for racial injustice. Right? I mean, you can find that, you know, in many different realms, right? Um, so, I mean, it's a little bit harder to do uh, that is uh, Lacanian psychoanalytic, it's a little harder to do, but as you can see here, Barry says, like Freudian critics, they pay close attention to unconscious motives and feelings, but instead of excavating for those of authors and characters, which Freudians do, they search out those of the text itself, uncovering contradictory undercurrents of meaning, which lie like a subconscious, like, like a subconscious beneath the conscious of the text. This is another way of defining the process of deconstruction and therefore takes us back to last week's or so last, last module, module three of post-structuralism. In other words, they're looking specifically at the text somewhere rather than say character motivation or author motivation to try to uncover some kind of, uh, you know, rupture, you might say in the text. Um, Lacan himself, um, you know, let's see, where is it? Uh, talks about it. Well, here's the early uh, part about the, the child recognizing himself. Uh, this word infants, you know, the footnote tells us is, you know, when you're a child and you'll have speech yet, you know, you're still an infant. This jubilant assumption of his specular image by the child that is, you know, the kind of light bulb goes off and the child smiles and he's able to understand that it's, you know, himself in the mirror. That's what he's talking about. The specular image by the child at the infant stage, still sunk in his motor and capacity and nursling dependence um, would seem to exhibit an exemplary situation, the symbolic matrix in which the I, notice it's a, uh, italicized, is precipitated in a primordial form before it is objectified into the dialectic of identification with the other and before language restores to it in the universal function as subject. Uh, this form would have to be called the ideal I. Um, he uses a word in here that I'm not sure you guys are familiar with, uh, dialectic of identification. Uh, with the other. So it's not difficult to understand, but I, I do want to make sure you understand uh, the term dialectic because uh, it's used in Marx, it's used in, uh, well, here in psychoanalysis and uh, history. So in your folder, you have this image uh, as a kind of simplified version of what we call Hegelian dialectics. So um, I'm, you know, kind of riffing off of here the big lie, like, you know, Trump won the election. Um, but basically, Hegelian dialectics is, is this here in this red box. Um, you have an idea known as a thesis, and then you have its opposite or rejection of the idea posed and antithesis. And then those two opposites cause some kind of crisis, but then that crisis is resolved into a synthesis or a merging or marrying of the two to some degree, a compromise. So this is what happens in Hegelian dialectic that you have this problem, reaction, solution till another problem occurs and then another reaction, then you have a solution, 
then you have another problem, another, and it goes on uh, ad infinitum, you know, that is forever. But what, in relation to what uh, Lacan just said is, you know, the child has a problem, which is, you know, not understanding what he sees in the mirror. And then the reaction is, you know, one of jubilation, right? And then the solution for the ideal I is the awareness of yourself as, as a subject, we might call it, or as he says, the ideal I. Um, so right there, the ideal I. Um, yeah, this is uh, Lacan's very kind of uh, tortured way of <laughs> deriving at uh, what he calls this mirror stage, right? So uh, yeah, I think that's about it for now. Uh, you feel free to write on any one of those. And uh, we, we don't, again, practice. Uh, you know, Barry mentions this. Uh, we don't practice psychoanalytic criticism all that much anymore, right? A distrust of Freud has grown strongly since the 1980s, partly as a result of his mainly negative views on women, right? Um, and then we've also kind of moved on from uh, psychoanalysis because there are so many other things to uh, consider, like you know, race and uh, gender and uh, economy or Marxism and so on, right? And we'll talk about uh, in a couple of weeks. All right, folks, so that uh, is due a week from today. That is your uh, response, your worksheet on psychoanalytic criticism, uh, Monday, February 21st. Hope this information helps and hopes that you guys, hope you guys are well. Take care, bye-bye.